Good morning, Calvary. I am so glad that you are here in this room this morning. I have good news, and it's good news for me. It may not be good news for you, but this past month, my wife and I have a baby who just celebrated his one-year birthday. He's a whole one-year-old. He's a cute kid up there. His name is Gabriel Jude, um, and we love him. Absolutely love Gabriel. And I'll be honest, I tell people this all the time. This is, this is not a secret, that I have never before having Gabriel enjoyed babies. I just... It was not my thing. I was not very comfortable with it. But if you're a parent, you know that there's this flip that gets, uh, this switch that gets flipped inside of you when you have your own kid and you become a baby person when that happens. And I, I'm not blowing smoke when I tell you that I love being with Gabriel. I love Gabriel. I love hanging out with Gabriel. I love coming home from work and seeing him smiling, laughing. We're trying to teach him how to walk right now. It is a ton of fun. Uh, we throw the ball back and forth as he like, attempts to try to throw and catch. It is an absolute blast. And I love, love, love being around Gabriel. And I talk about him all the time. But I have to be honest. I'm not a perfect man, nor am I a perfect father. And I will be honest when I tell you this, that I love being around Gabriel 95% of the time. <laughs> and there is a 5% of the time that I don't enjoy being around Gabriel, and it is when he looks like this behind me. I don't like nasty things. <laughs> I don't like things that are gross. I don't like things that smell. And if you come to our house any point about 6 p.m., any day of the week, he's usually gonna look like this during dinner time, and he splats food all over his face. I found mashed potatoes in his diaper one time, and he has drool and snot coming out of his nose. But the problem is he loves it. Look at that face. He loves it. He's having a great time. But I can't, I can't, I can't deal with it. I can't stand it. And I, I, I wait until he gets cleaned up, and then I can go back to hanging out with Gabriel. This is confession time. Do not judge me. You guys, I know some of you are the same way, so do not judge me on this. But there, there are times that is true that I like going towards Gabriel. I love hanging out with Gabriel. I like being near him and close to him. There are other times where I will make distance purposely from Gabriel. And that's true. I will either go towards him or create distance towards him. The, the story of Matthew that we're looking at today, I think Matthew is attempting for us to put ourselves into the story, to, to resonate with some of the characters inside of the story. And, and Matthew is inviting us to decide whether we are going to come towards Jesus or if we're going to create distance. And I think this is really important for us to reflect on because on one end of the spectrum, there, there is healing and there is hope and there is freedom. But on the other end of the spectrum, there is muteness and blindness and we just might miss out on the things of God. So the story we're looking at is found in Matthew chapter nine. Matthew chapter nine, in, in, in Matthew nine, it is the end of a small narrative piece in Matthew, the very end. And, and it is, is describing in, in Matthew five through seven, the kingdom of heaven. Then chapter eight is the displayment of the kingdom of heaven. But now chapter nine is us responding to the kingdom of heaven. We have seen it talked about, we've seen it displayed. Now Matthew is inviting us to respond to it. And there are different responses from, from different people. And we are supposed to, I think, identify with the characters of the story to see how we would respond to this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read this passage, and there's going to be a couple of different stories that we're going to go over this morning. And I, I want to encourage you to do this. As we read, I want you to take note. You can even write it down if you need to. But take note which character in this story best resonates with who you are and what you are going through right here and right now. Which one best describes you as a person, as a location, whatever it is. Which character do you resonate with the most? You can write it down, think about it. Does that make sense? You got that? Do we understand the assignment going forward here? So we're going to read. This is in Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 18. It says this, while he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. 
Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and the people playing pipes, he said, go away. This girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. I want to point our attention uh, to, to something very specific about the similarities between both the father and the woman in the story. And I want to point our attention to the desperation found in both of these characters. The desperation in both individuals. The father comes up before Jesus and kneels down before him and says, my, my, my daughter has just died. But if you come, you can make her well again. I want to reflect for a moment how ridiculous and fathom how crazy of a request this is. Like we look at these stories from a bias, knowing these stories or knowing what Jesus is capable of, but this guy has no context whatsoever to believe that Jesus could actually do this. Never in Matthew, this is the first time that we have seen any case of anyone being risen from the dead. We've never seen it before. This man surely has not seen it before. And he comes to Jesus says, my daughter has died, but you can make her well. And we know how crazy of a request this is because when Jesus gets there, everybody laughs at him because they think this is ridiculous. This is crazy. But it is a, a, a desperate request, a request that only a father of a, of a dead child can make. This is desperation time. He's out of options. There's no solution left. And the same is true for the woman. It says that the woman had been dealing with this uh, condition that caused her to bleed for over a decade. And we know from other gospels that, that she, in this story, that she has been to many different doctors and nobody could heal her. Nobody could find a solution. She was completely out of options for 12 years. She dealt with this condition. She was out of options. Nobody could help her. But she comes to Jesus. So that is the similarities, but unfortunately that's where the similarities in these character Stop, because there's actually some major differences in these characters as well. They both approach Jesus in this desperation, but, but it says that the father was a synagogue leader, that he was somebody who, who had some kind of respect, maybe even authority in his community and in the, his religious circles. And he comes before Jesus and he it says he kneels down and bows before him. And he doesn't care who sees him. He goes in front of everyone else. It doesn't matter who sees. And he boldly declares, Jesus, if you come, you can help. I need, I need your help here. And he doesn't care who notices, doesn't care who sees, but he comes before Jesus. The woman, on the other hand, is very different. She does not come before Jesus boldly declaring in front of everyone. In fact, she tries to almost hide. Whether it's because of fear or embarrassment or, or whatever, she tries to not be noticed. She does not want anyone else to see her. She doesn't even want Jesus to see her. More than that, as much as it pains us to know this, it, because she was a woman, she would not have gotten the same amount of respect, dignity, and honor as the man would have in this situation. But the funny thing is, the interesting thing is, as it so often is about Jesus, is that both requests were fulfilled equally. Both requests were fulfilled equally. That it did not matter how they approached Jesus, that both were healed and both received what they asked for. And I think what Matthew is attempting to do here, it, he wants us to identify with either one of these characters and let us know that you can approach Jesus in any way. That you do not have to approach him in one specific form, in one specific pattern. That you can approach Jesus as you are. And Matthew is inviting us and he's showing us this picture and he's inviting us. How are you and I going to respond to this Jesus? How are you and I going to react to this invitation for us to come before Jesus? And here's why this is important. 
because it is not the manner in which they presented themselves before Jesus that got the request fulfilled. It is not the manner in which uh, they presented themselves before Jesus that opened doors between them and the kingdom of God. But get this, get this. This is gonna be the, the crux of everything we talk about. Humility, humility is the key that opens doors in the kingdom of heaven. Humility is the key that opens doors in the kingdom of heaven. And this is not humility like, oh, I'm too humble to take some kind of compliment or something like this. This is humility that is found in deep, dark desperation. When all other options are gone, this is the humility that says, I have no other way forward. I have no other options. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. This is the humility and desperation that comes after spending years, years waiting for a solution that seems that it would never come. This is the desperation that these two are walking in with. And I have to recognize this as well. I have to say this. I recognize that myself being a younger person, <laughs> I recognize that there are limitations to my own experiences in life. And I recognize that I have not had the opportunity yet to live long years of life waiting and waiting and waiting for something. I, I, I see those limitations in myself. However, I know that there are people in this room and watching now where this is no foreign concept. I know that there are people here who have lived this every single day, who have felt this desperation every single day. And the invitation to Matthew for you and for me, how are we going to respond to Jesus? Are we going to press towards Jesus? Are we going to come close to him? Are we gonna present ourselves in humble desperation before him? Or will we create distance? And ultimately, this looks like an active relationship of prayer. That you can come before him in prayer and approach him with who you are, with what you need. Whether it's for your own needs, like the woman, or if, or if it's for somebody else, like the father. That you can intercede in prayer before Jesus, and you can come in close proximity to him. How are you, how are you going to respond? I think that's the invitation here. The story continues, and it gets better. I think it gets better, at least. The story continues uh, in, in verse 27. It says this, Jesus went on from there. Two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. So immediately after these events happen where he heals the woman and he heals the daughter, uh, he moves exactly right after that. And these blind men call out and said, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind man came to him and he asked them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. While they were going out, again, one right after another, a man who was demon possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. When the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So the two blind men, they come before Jesus and they scream out to him. They say, have mercy on us. They're yelling above the crowd. And Jesus approaches them and he says, do you believe that I can do this? And they say, yes, we believe. It's why we're here. We believe that you can do this. And again, I want to point into detail the amount of desperation and humility once again that they are displaying in this moment. That they have to scream above the crowd so that people can hear them. They have no other options. There is no cure for blindness. There is nothing that they can do, but yet they fall before Jesus and say, have mercy. Do we recognize, do we see the desperate humility once again in these characters? But they also, they also say something else. 
They say, son of David, they scream it, son of David, son of David, son of David, have mercy on us. This is interesting because this term, son of David, this is the first time in Matthew that this phrase has been uh, called or talked to about Jesus. It is the first time that somebody has called Jesus son of David. However, it is not the first time we have seen this term before. And this is important. Lock in with me here because this is, this is gonna be huge. Matthew 1, verse 1, the very beginning of Matthew, it says this. The, that, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And directly after this verse is an entire lineage of Jesus' uh, ancestors and the people that came before him. It's the part of the Bible that you and I mostly skip when we read it because it's just a whole bunch of just random people's names. Uh, but it comes before and everyone is listed out. And the point of it, the reason that it's there is that Matthew is attempting to communicate and make the case that Jesus came from King David of the Old Testament. And this is not just to be like, oh, cool, my grandfather was King David, some ancestry.com kind of thing. That's that's not the point of it. The point is, is that there was a prophecy that said that the Messiah would come from the line of David. And when the blind man call out, this is, this is big. When the blind man call out son of David, they are recognizing who Jesus is. Get this. You're not ready for this. It is the blind men. It is the blind men who are the first to see who Jesus really is. Can you get that with me, church? It is the blind men who see who Jesus really is. But it gets better. It gets even better. So after this, Jesus comes and he heals a man who was oppressed by a demon. And he pulls him out and it says that the man who was mute, he could not speak, speaks. And right after that, three things happen right in a row. Three people speak, and I think Matthew does this intentionally. Three people speak right in a row. The first is the mute people, that they were oppressed by a demon, and he speaks. The second is the crowds. The crowds see what happened, and it says they spoke. And they said, this is amazing. We've never seen anything like this in all of Israel. This is amazing. And they spoke. And the third people to speak in this were the Pharisees, and they spoke. But what did they say? They said, it's not because he's the son of David. It's because he's, he's the prince of demons. That, that's why he's able to do this. He's not, it's, it's like they're rebuttaling what, he's, what they said about him in the beginning. They said, it's not, it's not because he's the Messiah. It's because he has the prince of demons that he's able to do this. And I think what Matthew is trying to connect us to is that everyone else was able to speak the things of God except for the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the only ones who got it wrong. The Pharisees were the only one in the story who got it wrong. Can I tell you this right now? Matthew is trying to tell you and I that the blind and the mute people in the story are not the blind and the mute people. The blind and mute people in the story are the Pharisees. They are unable to see the things of God and they are unable to speak the things of God. But the question for me, at least this is what I think about, I don't know about you, why? Why could, what was the difference between them and the Pharisees, or between them and the blind men? They witnessed the same exact miracles They heard the same exact words. They were in the same exact location. Yet the blind men, the mute men, the father, the woman, they all went towards Jesus. But the Pharisees were the only ones in the story who created distance. Why? The woman received life back into her body. The father got her daughter, got his daughter back and reunited with the family. The mute men could speak and the blind could see, but the Pharisees remained as mute and as blind as ever. Why? And I think that the Pharisees were the only one in this story. They were the only ones in this story who did not approach Jesus in desperate humility. Every other character went towards Jesus, presenting them with their ridiculous needs in their life. Some fell down and kneeling, some screamed at the top of their lungs, some quietly went up behind him and touched his cloak. 
Every single one approached Jesus in desperate humility, but the Pharisees were the only ones, the only ones who created distance and they missed the working of God in their life. They missed the working of God. Matthew's invitation for me and for you is, are we going to press towards Jesus? Or are we going to create distance? And the question for me and for you is, who do you resonate most with in this story? Where do you find yourself? Do you find yourself as the woman who has been waiting for years for some kind of hope, for some kind of light at the end of this tunnel? Are you coming before Jesus with a family member who seems so far gone, who has no options left, or or, or is making unwise choices with their lives and you are bringing them before Jesus? Or, Or are you the one who screams at the top of your lungs for some kind of mercy? Who are you in this story? And are you going to draw close to Jesus or are you going to create distance? That is Matthew's invitation and and response that we get to respond to in this story. There's something else here too that I think is really interesting. Three times, three times in Matthew chapter nine, two in the story that we read today, it says that Jesus responded. Jesus responded to the request and he, he fulfilled what the request was because of their faith. It says, because of your faith, daughter, you have been made well. Side note, this is really random. Side note, I want to also point out here the amount of care that Jesus shows to both a woman and a daughter in this time who everyone else would have overlooked. And I think that speaks millions and millions of times of what Jesus is about and who he is. Side note, leave that, take that as what it is. But their faith made them well. And faith is an act of taking trust in a step towards Jesus. It is us deciding that I believe, and so I'm going to take a step towards him. I'm not going to create distance. I'm not going to stay where I am, but I'm going to come towards Jesus. So the, the invitation for us is, is our faith going to be pushing us towards Jesus? And at least for me, my first thought when I think of this is, well, my faith is not very confident right now. I don't actually know if Jesus could do this. And maybe I will wait until a time where I'm more bold or more courageous, and then I will come close to Jesus. I think what these stories prove is that the size of our faith matters far less than the object of our faith. The size of our faith matters far less than the object of our faith. The woman comes before Jesus terrified, fearful, embarrassed. We don't know, but she does not want to be seen. She tries to sneak up, grab his cloak without anyone noticing. And Jesus fulfilled the request. Will you draw close to Jesus? Or will you create distance? Because more times than not, at least for me, I am the Pharisee in this story. And whether because of fear or anger or pride or apathy or hurt or anything else, I will create distance from Jesus and I will not come in close proximity in prayer, presenting the things that I need. And the danger is that I just might miss out on the things of God, I can remain blind to what he is doing and remain mute to the things of God. I don't know about you, but that's not where I want to be. Will we draw close to him? And who are you in this story? I'm going to have the worship team come back up. I'm going to point to one verse um, that, that I think directly ties in 
to everything that we have been talking about this morning in this specific passage. In fact, pastor read this at the beginning uh, of the service, so this will be familiar to you. Isaiah 35, five through six, this is a prophecy that God is giving the people of Israel who are about to be in captivity uh, in the nation of Babylon. And he's, he's giving them a promise that he will come and rescue them. So it is a prophecy for them, but it is fully and realized in the person of Jesus later. Uh, Matthew, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 35, verse five says this. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Sound familiar? This is exactly, exactly what Jesus was doing in this moment. It is, he is fulfilling the saving of his people of Israel. And verse 10 continues. Uh, we're gonna skip there. It says, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is a promise that God is giving us, that there is joy and there is gladness to be claimed, to be found, to be experienced when we draw close and come in close proximity to Jesus. That sorrow, that disease, that sickness, that death will not win the day. And that gladness and joy will overcome. And whether we experience that healing here and now and today, or whether we experience that healing when Jesus comes back for us again, there will be joy. So the question for you and I, will we draw towards that promise in faith saying, I believe that God, you can do only what you can do. I'm out of options, so I'm coming to you. Or will we create distance? Who are you in this story? And will you draw near to him? Let's pray. Father, we come before you knowing that we are powerless without you. We have desperate needs. We pray that we come before you in humility and desperation. Whether we're kneeling, whether we're shouting, whether we're coming up behind you and grabbing your cloak, but that we advance towards you because you are welcoming all who come near you. You do not turn us away. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for that joy that you promise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand as we continue in worship?